Hello students, welcome to our channel Parallax. My name is Pallavi and today we are going to discuss a physics past paper and the past paper number is 0625. This is the extended theory paper, paper number four, as you can see over here. Okay, and this is the February, March 2021 paper. It's a one hour, 15 minutes long paper. So in the question paper, you can write using blue and black ink. I'll be using red ink separately to explain concepts. So now without wasting more time, let's begin. As you can see the first question. So the first question says there is a piece of glass which has a thickness of two centimeters. And the area is 0 0.15 meters square. The density of the glass is 2.6 times 10 to the power 3 kg per meter cube. And the thickness is given as 2 centimeters. Now remember, whenever we are doing such questions, you have to keep in mind that the units are proper. That is, if you are using meters, then you have to convert everything into meters. Or if you are using the SI unit, then you should use uh, all the units as SI units. What I mean by that is that when the thickness is given as two centimeters over here, you should use, you should convert it into meters. So this will be 0 0.02 meters. Now, if we have to start with this, so how do we do it? The density is given, now we know that density is what? Density is given as mass by volume. That's how we calculate the density, right? And this is mass in kg, volume in meter cube. Now, it shows that we have to calculate the weight of the piece of glass. Now, weight, what do we mean by weight? The weight means the force, right? Weight is a force, we know that. And the formula for that is M times G. G over here, we can use as 10 meters per second square. M, M we don't know. So we have to use, we have to find out the M using this density equation. That is what we are going to do precisely. So, Let's begin th with the calculations. Now I'm going to use blue ink over here to make this simpler. That is what you have to write in your paper. So if, if this is the question, it's a three marker. So you can show some calculations if you want to. Density is equal to mass by volume. Write down, we don't know what the mass is. So we will find out the mass. Mass is what? It is density, which is given over here as 2.6 times 10 to the power 3 times volume. Now, what is the volume? Volume means this area times the thickness, right? Volume is basically the space occupied. So, it is the area times the thickness, that is the space occupied by this object. It's form of a cuboid. So, in cuboid also, the other formula which we usually know is length times width times height. So length time width is area, that is what we are using, times height or thickness in this case, which is 0 0.02 meters. So that is what we will use over here as well. So the area is given as 0 0.15 times uh, the thickness, which is 0 0.02. So our mass comes out to be density times volume. This is our mass. We need not immediately multiply it because we have to find the weight. Weight means what? Weight, the next line we can write it like this. Weight is equal to mass times g. G is the acceleration due to gravity. In which case, in this case, it is 10 meters per second square. So we just have to multiply this whole thing with 10 because that's what it will be our weight. So it will be 2.6 times 0 0.15 times 0 0.02 times 10 to the power 4 now because we have multiplied the 10 over here. Now let's quickly calculate what we get when we do this multiplication. So it's 2.6 times 0 0.15 times 0 0.02 uh, equal to 0 0.0078. And this is equal to 0 0.0078 times 10 to the power 4. That is, if you multiply this with 10 to the power 4, you get a 78, right? That is, the point shifts towards the right by four places. So that's how we get a 78. 
and its weight, which is a force. The unit for it is Newtons. You have to be very careful with the SI units. That is what unit you are writing down the answer as. If the unit is not specified, then you will have to write the unit. Now, keeping that in mind, this is our uh, this is our answer for this particular question, which is 78 Newtons. Now, let's quickly move on to the next part. So over here, we have the same, uh, we have the same glass sheet over here and it says the piece of the glass shown in figure 1.1 is used as a vertical viewing window of an aquarium, right? The atmospheric pressure outside the aquarium is 1.6, 1.0 times 10 to the power 5 pascals. Remember, pascals is the unit for measuring pressure. And it also says that the average pressure on inside of the aquarium window is 1.3 times 10 to the power 5 pascals. So basically what is happening, if this is the glass which we just now found the volume of, uh, the atmospheric pressure from outside is 1 into 10 to the power 5 pascals and from inside it is 1.3 into 10 to the power 5 pascals, right? That's our pressure. The question says calculate the resultant force acting on the window due to these pressures. Now, what do we mean by that? So there are two pressures acting in opposite directions, right? We have to find the resultant force. So resultant force, how do we find? Now, what is the relation between force and pressure? So let's keep that in mind. Force up per unit area will give you pressure. That is, if you know the area, you can find the pressure if force is given and vice versa. In this case, pressure is given to us. So that means this is our window. This is the outside pressure. This is the inside pressure. Let's find out the forces. So force will be what? Outside pressure, let's name it as capital P, times the area minus the inward pressure. Let's name it as small p times the area. This will be our net force or resultant force. Now, why did I subtract this? Now, see, the pressure is like this. Therefore, the forces will be in opposite directions. Whenever you have force in opposite direction and you have to calculate the resultant, remember, force is a vector quantity. So you will have to subtract the two forces. Now, keeping that in mind, let's do the subtraction quickly. So over here we have, so what we are doing essentially over here, force is pressure times area. That is what we are using. So the net force will be, now this is bigger than this, right? And this is the pressure on the inside. That means from inside, how much is the air pushing the window outside, right? So towards outside. So that force, that will be the direction of force as well, which will be outwards. So I'll come back to that later. However, this will be 1.3 times 10 to the power 5 pascals, which is the pressure, and minus 1.0 times 10 to the power 5 pascals, which is the outward pressure and times the area. The area over here is given as 0 0.15 meters squared. So we will use that. So in place of area, I can write 0 0.15. So this comes out to be my resultant force, net force. So 1.3 minus 1.0 is 0 0.3 times 0 0.15 times 10 to the power 5. If you multiply this, let's see what we get. So it's a 0 0.3 times 0 0.15. We get a 0 0.045 times 10 to the power 5. If you convert it into standard form, what happens? The point, the decimal shifts two places to the right, so it becomes 4.5. If it shifts two places to the right, what happens to the power of the 10? It will be 10 to the power 3 newtons. So our net force will be 4.5 times 10 to the power 3 newtons. Now let's quickly understand or try to understand why did we subtract? So basically, if this is the outward pressure, that is the air which is pushing the window from outside, and this is the inward pressure, that is the air which is pushing the window outwards, right? So if you know the pressure, the force, this will be the direction of the outward force, this will be the direction of the inward force the net resultant force will be in this direction because if you see carefully, the area is same, so area doesn't change. Force is nothing but pressure times area. So if the pressure is more, then the force will be more. 
from inside when we look at the air when it is pushing the window outwards the inward pressure is 1.3 times 10 to the power 5. So therefore the direction of our resultant force will also be outwards that is it will be the air will be pushing the window outwards. I hope this was clear. Let's move on to the next question. This is a four marker. Okay, now let's move on to the next one. So what does the question say? Look at the C part. The figure 1.2, so this is the figure, it's a vacuum pump connected to the top of a vertical cube, a tube with its lower end immersed in the tank of a liquid. The pump reduces the pressure above the column to zero and the pressure at point X. So this is point X, which is given over here. The pressure is given as 9.6. Let's write down. Pressure at point X is 9.6 times 10 to the power 4 pascals, right? We have to calculate, and the height is given over here as well. So let's write down what all is given. The height is 12 meters. We have to calculate the density of the liquid. Now, I'm sure you all will say that, okay, the formula which we have to use, we know uh, in case of liquids is pressure, which is H rho G, right? This is how we find pressure in liquids. So uh, if you have to find the density over here, which is rho over here, that is what we are finding. So make rho the subject, what do we get? P by H G, that is what you have to do to find the or calculate the density over here. So let's quickly first do that and then I'll move on to the explanation part. So rho over here will be given as 9.6 times 10 to the power 4 divided by height, which is 12 times 10. Now, in such cases, what I do is let's first calculate the decimal part. That is 9.6 divided by 12. So what do we get? A 0 0.8. And we have 10 to the power 4 and 10 over here. So this will come out to be 10 to the power 3. If you want to get rid of the decimal at overall, so what you do, you shift the decimal three places towards the right, so it becomes 800. Now, let's be very clear about the units. So over here, the pressure is given in pascals, which is SI unit, and over here, it is 12 meters, again, SI unit. So our density will also come out to be kg per meter cube. That will be the SI unit, right? Now, Let's quickly discuss what happens in case of liquids. How do we find out the pressure, right? So basically, at this, when we are looking at this liquid, and if we are talking about this point, then we calculate the pressure, the liquid which is on top of this point, that is the liquid which, has a, which is at a height of 12 meters above this point X, that will be exerting pressure. So the pressure will be in this, of course, liquid exerts pressure in all directions, but at this point, if you are calculating the pressure, it will be due to the liquid, which is above that point. So that is a very important point, which you need to consider whenever you are doing questions on liquid pressures, right? So whenever we say H rho G, that formula, whenever we use to calculate the pressure in liquids, we have to consider that H over here is the liquid, which is above that point, where we are calculating the pressure, right? Okay, keeping that in mind, let's move on to the next question. So we have it over here. Now, the second question says that state what is meant by the moment of force about a point. So basically moment of force is the turning effect of force. That is how much is the force making the object turn? Now, over here we have a question. So if at all there is some explanation required, I will use this question as the example, right? Okay, so the figure over here shows large crane on a construction site and it is lifting a block of mass 14,000 kg. So this block has mass 14,000 kg. This crane is lifting this block and this is the pivot or the point where this is attached, right? This long handle of the crane and the weight, that is the block, is attached at this point, which is 20 meters from this fixed point. Now, why is this important? We'll come to that. We have to calculate the moment about A. So whenever we are asked to find the moment about this point A, what is the formula for moment of force? We take the force. Now, look at very carefully at this picture. We have a block over here. 
Now, what is the direction of the force? If you have to say just force, we're not talking about moment of force, just the force over here. So the force is acting downwards, isn't it? Which force are we talking about? Yes, we are talking about the force of gravity. So there's a force of gravity which is acting downwards. And what is that force equal to? We know that is equal to m times g. So if you have to calculate the force of gravity, this will be 14,000 times 10. That will be the force, right? Okay, now let's talk about, over here we have to calculate the moment, right? That is the turning effect of force. Now, how does that help or how do we calculate that? So it is basically RF, turning effect of force is given as RF. You can write this in blue ink also because it's kind of part of the question. Turning effect of force is equal to RF. Now, what do we call R over here? R perpendicular, that is a perpendicular distance. Now look very carefully over here. From the pivot, and the force, if you look at the angle which the two are making, it's a 90 degree angle over here, isn't it? So the R over here is nothing but 20. So 20, which is R, times F, which is acting downwards, which is 14,000 times 10. And let's see what that comes out to be. So let's quickly calculate. We have 14,000 times 20 times 10. So this comes out to be once. So how many zeros after 28? It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros. So we can write it as 2.8 times 10 to the power 6. Now what will be the unit? As I said, whenever units are not given, you have to write down the units very properly. So it is force. This is what? R perpendicular, which is distance, meters times F, which is force, Newton. So our unit comes out to be Newton meters, right? Now, what will be the direction of this moment? So this question is still not complete because moment of force is a vector quantity. So whenever you are finding a vector quantity, you need to specify the direction as well. So look very carefully. So we are moving from the pivot and we are moving towards the force. So how are we moving? Look. This is how it's moving, right? That is if the, this is how it's moving. So this is the direction, right? However, in this case, the crane is lifting the weight. So the direction over here is from R towards F. So this is the direction. What type of direction is it? Clockwise or anti-clockwise? So it's a clockwise direction or clockwise moment. Okay, keeping that in mind, let's move on to the next one. Now, speed is a scalar quantity and velocity is a vector quantity. State the difference between a scalar and a vector quantity. This is a typical theoretical question. So uh, we both, we all know that scalar quantities have only magnitude, no direction. So when we are only talking about magnitude and not the direction, we are, that's a scalar quantity. In this case, it's speed. On the other hand, vector quantities have both magnitude as well as direction, which is velocity in this case. Examples are speed, uh, scalar quantity will be mass, distance, some of the examples. Vectors can, vector quantities can be force, acceleration, displacement. There are a lot of other vector quantities as well as scalar quantities which you can specify and you will get the points. Now let's come to the next part. So over here there's a figure and it shows two forces acting on the object. So you have to draw a scale diagram to determine the resultant force acting on the object. State the scale you use. Now, this is kind of an important question. However, I do not have this rule to use over here. So I will tell you what to do exactly in the exam, okay? So we have to first specify a scale. And before moving ahead with the scale diagram, let me first tell you what exactly we are talking about here. So we have to find the resultant force when two forces are given. And what have we learned from the triangular law of vectors? triangular law. What do we know? So if I have one vector like this, and if I have another vector like this, then if I have to make the resultant vector, how do I make it? It will be from the initial point to the final point of the second vector, right? Now, the main rule which we are following over here is if these are two forces, let's say, both are vectors, it has to be head to tail, and then again, the head has to be attached to the tail of the next vector. Keep that in mind. So that is what you have to do over here also. 
Only thing is that you have to take a specific scale. So the scale we can take over here is, let's say, um, one centimeters is equal to five newtons. That means one centimeter is five newtons. So you have to make 20 newtons. 20 newtons will be what? Four centimeters. So basically you will draw, you will take your scale and draw a four centimeter long line acting downwards. That is your 20 Newton force. That is how you represent the 20 Newton force. So you will draw, I repeat what you will do. The scale we have chosen, you can choose any scale. You can, it's preferably choose a scale such that both the quantities are multiples of the scale. So suppose I take scale of one centimeter as five Newton. So I have 20 and 30, both are multiples of five. So that will be a very useful information for me when I actually draw the figure. You will see how it is. So uh, five Newton is one centimeter. So if I have four centimeters means I'm drawing a 20 Newton force, right? On skin. So this is my four centimeters, hypothetically. In the actual exam, you have to draw this. And then we have a 30 Newton and it is at 60 degrees with this. Now remember a rule about vectors. That is, they can be displaced without moving the direction. What I mean is you can displace this vector like this and the direction will not change. So without changing, you can make uh, this vector parallel to its original form and you can displace it. And still nothing will change. You will be changing nothing. So we'll do the same thing. Now, before we do, do that, this angle was 60. So if you actually displace it like this, Look very carefully what's happening over here. So we have a 20 Newton force like this. And we have a 30 Newton force like this, which is at the angle 60 degrees, right? So what you can do is you can shift, you can shift this 30 Newton force and you can shift it over here. Now, my question is that if this angle originally was 60, then this angle over here between the two vectors will be 120. So be very careful when you are drawing the particular 30 Newton force. Now, before that, before that, before we draw that, 30 Newton is what? 30 Newton is, so one centimeter is five Newton. That means six centimeters will be 30 Newtons. So you have to draw a six centimeter long line. And the angle which you will make will be 120 degrees. So what I mean by that is place your scale over here, take your protractor and draw a 120 degree angle at that, draw a six centimeter long line, right? When you draw that, so this will be six centimeter means we are representing 30 Newton force, right? Now we have to draw the resultant. So the resultant will be from here to the end point of this. So join these two, find out the angle and also find out the length. So whatever length you get in centimeters, multiply that with five and that will be the actual length of your force vector or resultant force vector. The When you do this whole, uh, when you complete the question, the answer which you will get is it will be a 33 to 40 degree angle which will be there between the two vectors. That is when you have this vector and this vector and the resultant vector like this. So this angle will come out to be 33 to 40 degrees, right? And it will be a 40 to 47 Newton force which you will get over here. So that you will get when you use scale and protractor. Unfortunately, I cannot use that over here, but I hope you understood how to draw this, right? Now, moving on to the next question, the third question. Now, this is a conceptual question, so I'm going to just very quickly go through this. A power station burns waste materials from farm crops to generate electricity. State and explain whether this process is renewable. Of course, it's renewable because what is the explanation behind this? That the farm crops can be grown again. That is, crops can be regrown, so it's a renewable resource. Next, the power station uses uh, some of its waste thermal energy to heat water for houses in a nearby town. So this waste thermal energy is used to heat water in houses. 
state one problem of using the waste um, energy in this way, power station is far from town. So when it when they say power station is far from the town, we know that the water will get cooled and as a result, there will be energy lost. So that is what you will write as a problem. And what is the way of reducing this? Using insulating pipes, right? That is insulating pipes means bad conductors of heat. That is the what they will not let the heat loose from the water, right? If you use insulated pipes. State two environmental consequences of burning coal to generate electricity. So we know that global warming because when we burn coal, it's essentially carbon and combination with oxygen will lead to carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So it contributes to global warming. Second one is, of course, it's carbon dioxide. So it leads to air pollution. There are a lot of other chemicals which are also, um, when combustion of coal happens, there's a lot of other chemicals which are given out or harmful gases which are given out to the atmosphere. So again, that can be a consequence which you can write over here and you will get your marks. Moving on to the next question, the fourth one. In terms of momentum of molecules, explain how a gas exert pressure on the walls of its container. Now, yes, we can read what we have written over here, but before that, let me explain this to you. So what happens over here is we have a wall of a container, let's say. This is my wall of a container. And we are talking about a very small area over here. Okay. There are gas molecules inside the container. We are talking about one such molecule. It will be almost similar for all the molecules. Now, when these molecules have some kinetic energy, they are moving with some velocity V, right? Now, this molecule, it hits the wall of the container. So what will be the momentum? It will be mv, mass times volume, right? And we assume that this collision with the wall is elastic. Elastic means the once it hits the wall, it will rebound like this. And now the momentum is in the opposite direction, assuming there is no loss of energy, nothing happening. So it's minus mv in the opposite direction, right? That's the momentum. If you have to find the change in momentum, it will be final mi minus mv minus initial. So it will be minus 2 mv. Many students make a mistake over here. That is, they make it like this. They say, okay, the final will be mv and it will be minus mv. So it will be zero. No, that doesn't happen because you have to consider the direction over here. It's not mv minus mv. It's mv minus minus of mv. So it's actually getting added up. This minus over here shows direction. That's all. So this is our change in momentum. Now, if there is a change in momentum, what is force basically? It's change in momentum, right? What is force? Force is also defined as change in momentum. So this is basically the force which is exerted by the molecules on the wall of the container, right? And if there is force with which molecules are that force which they are exerting on the wall, that means force per unit area. That is, if we are talking about this area, then the force which all the molecules are exerting on this particular area divided by that area will be the pressure. So there will be some pressure which will be exerted by the gas which is inside the container to the walls of the container, right? I hope the explanation was clear. Now let's read out what you have to actually write down over here. So we have the molecules of the gas constantly strike the walls and undergo elastic collision with the walls of the container. Therefore, momentum, mass and velocity of the molecules changes in this process. Force is defined as rate of change of momentum and pressure is defined as force acting per unit area. As a result, the molecules of the gas will exert pressure on the walls of the container. With that, we move on to the next part of the question. So we have... Uh, the next question, let's read it out. The fixed mass of gas of volume V1 is at pressure P1. It is compressed to volume V2. Complete the equation for the final pressure P2. Now, before we move ahead to the next part, we know from gas laws that P1 V1 will be equal to P2 V2, right? Using this equation, you have to find the final pressure P2. See, it's a two marker, so you don't have to think much about it. Just state the equation over here and find out the value of P2. That is, make P2 the subject. When you make P2 the subject, what happens? It's P1 V1 divided by V2, and that's your answer. So complete the equation for final pressure P2. This is your equation. 
Now the next question says, state and explain how the final pressure compares with P2 when the temperature of the gas increases during the compression. So till now we discussed about the final pressure. Now what will happen if there is an increase in the temperature? So the answer to this will be, if there is an increase, then the actual P2 will be more than this P2, or the final pressure will be greater when temperature is increased. Now, why is that so? Again, it's the same explanation which we just gave in the previous question. That is, when the temperature increases, now what will happen to the kinetic energy of the molecules? Obviously, they are moving faster, so they will have higher kinetic energy, greater momentum. As a result, more the changing momentum is equal to force. So again, rate of change of momentum is equal to force. So again, the force will be greater. If force is greater, then there will be greater pressure on the walls of the container. And as a result, the final pressure will be more if temperature is more, right? That is what you have to write over here. Now, moving on to the next question. So we have over here, what you have to tell over here is state the name of the reflection of sound wave, which... Uh, reflection of sound wave or ultrasound wave. So echo is the name. That is when the sound wave or ultrasound wave is reflecting, we call it echo. Now the P part says figure 5.1 shows an ultrasound wave being used to scan an internal organ of the human body. Now whenever such questions come, please don't get scared by looking at the question because it's an ultrasound question. See, you have done the waves chapter, right? You know the wave equation. Even if it is a sound wave, the equation of wave will still stay the same. So keep that in mind whenever such a question comes. Um, coming back to the question. So ultrasound wave has a frequency. So let's quickly write down what all is given. F, which is frequency, is 2 megahertz. Megahertz mean 2 into 10 to the power 6 hertz. Remember, we always take care of the units. It passes through human tissue at a speed. Now speed is given as 1500 meters per second. You have to find the wavelength. Now, wavelength is given as what? It is the V, that is the velocity, right? By frequency, isn't it? Or F lambda is equal to V. You can use whatever equation suits you, right? Now, we have to find the wavelength. So, we will just take up our calculator and quickly calculate this. 1500 is our velocity divided by frequency, which is 2. So, this comes out to be 750. So it is 750 times 10 to the power 6. Now, if you have to move two places, the point is over here. You are shifting two places to the left now. So it will become 6 and it will be 10 to the power 4, right? So this will be 7.5 times 10 to the power 4 meters. That will be the wavelength of our wave, right? Okay. Now let's, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, now a quick correction over here. See, this is V by F. So it's V, which is 1500, divided by F, which is 2 times 10 to the power 6 is in the denominator, right? So we forgot to mention that. Uh, now let me repeat this. So V by F is our lambda. B is 1500 divided by 2 times 10 to the power 6. This is our lambda. So this comes out to be 750 times 10 to the power minus 6 because this will also move up, right? So therefore, when it shifts to 2 places on the left, it will be 10 to the power minus 4, not 10 to the power 4. So that's a correction, a quick correction, which I'll make over here. Let me erase this so that there is no confusion as well as this. I hope this is clear, right? Okay, let's move on to the next question. Now, figure 5.2 shows crests of a wave from a point source S approaching a straight barrier. So this is the straight barrier which we are talking about. And these are the sources. Now you have to indicate and label one wavelength. This is a very typical question. But before we move on to the actual question and solving it, let's quickly understand what do we mean by these spherical uh, lines which are drawn over here. So we have a source like this, which is giving out waves in all directions. Let's say these are the waves, right? If we have to make wave fronts, so how do we make wave fronts from this source? 
we make semicircles like this. Why are we making semicircles? Actually, it's a circular wavefront, but however, the wave is moving in this direction. If we say that the rays are moving from left to right, then the wavefronts will be semicircular as this case. So these lines over here are wavefronts. Now, the property of wavefronts over here will be that if you draw a ray of light, the wavefront will be perpendicular at all points. What I mean by that is, if this is the ray, then this angle over here will always be perpendicular. So you have to make the rays accordingly, right? I hope this part is clear. Now you have to indicate one wavelength. So this length over here is of the wavefront over here. That is the difference between the two wavefronts. That is one wavelength. Then you will have to draw three crests of the wave reflected from the barrier. So you have to first show how this will get reflected from the barrier, right? Now this is, remember the laws of reflection. That is the angle of incidence was equal to angle of reflection. So let's quickly draw the normal first. So you have this as the normal. And if you have one wave, which is like this, then the reflected wave will be like this, right? Please make these at angles. The incident angle will be equal to the reflected angle. So this is how you have to make the rays. Okay. Also, once you have drawn that, now make the wave fronts. So wave fronts will also be perpendicular to the direction of the wave like this. And the reflected wave fronts will be from here. These will be the reflected wave fronts like this. Each of these will be crests. You can draw these as crests. You can draw three reflected, three uh, incident wave crests like this. And the, keeping the wavelengths equal. So remember that the wavelength will not change when it is getting reflected at this point. So this is what you have to make over here. That is the incident ray is getting reflected. The angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. Then make the wavefronts, which are spherical. And keep the wavelength same in case of incident as well as reflected rays. Okay, now let's move on to the next part. So this is a full scale diagram showing a converging lens. There are two principal focuses, F1 and F2, and an object, which is PO. Look, the object is upside down, but do not worry. You have to draw two rays from point O. Let me just make this, yeah. So you have to draw two rays from point O of the object to determine the position of the image. So let's do that. We know that this is between focus and this, right? So one ray like this, parallel to the principal axis, will always pass through the focus F1. And another one will be lying, will be from the optical, the center of the lens like this. And then you will use dotted lines to extend these rays backwards. Let's do that. So we will just extend them backwards like this and also extend the other one also backward. Make sure that this is still a straight line, keeping that in mind. And see where the two rays meet. Okay. This is what you have to do in the exam as well. So these two are meeting over here. That is where you will draw the image. So this will be your image. So you have extended the rays backwards. These are not. So basically, let's draw the arrows because this is how the rays are traveling. So the actual rays are not meeting. Instead, you have made dotted lines and extended them backwards. So the black part which I'm doing is the actual, actually how the rays are meeting backwards, right? Virtually they're meeting. They're not actually meeting, they're meeting virtually. Whenever the, the rays meet virtually, there is a virtual image which is formed. And as we see, this image is much bigger than the original object, right? Now let's 
look at the questions which are there. So you have to measure the length of the image. It will come out to be 2.4 to 3.6 centimeters. Use your scale or ruler to do that. Then we have ring three descriptions of the image. So it's magnified, we know that. It is virtual, we know that. And it is same way up as the object. So the object was upside down, so the image will also be upside down. It's not upside down compared to the object. Please don't use this because that's not true. We have seen that it is same way as the object, right? Now let me use blue ink again to circle this. So we have magnified, we have virtual, and we have same way up as the object. Let's move on to the next part. Now figure the C part. It shows three rays of green light passing through the glass blocks. You have to draw three rays of red light approach the glass blocks in the same path as the rays of green light. You have to draw the path of these rays of red light to the right of the glass blocks. So basically there is one principle which we will follow over here that is the red light it bends least. We know that. So basically that is what we will use here. So one ray of red light but the refraction will happen although, but it will bend less than the green light. Similarly, one ray of red light on this side and it will bend less than the green light, right? So just have to show less bending like this. And the point where these two meet will be further on the right of the original point of the green light. So that is what you have to show using your scale. You have to draw this and you will get your marks. It's a two marker. So for two rays, you will get the marks. Moving on. The seventh question says that um, it shows a horizontal conducting wire XY. So it's a conducting wire between two opposite magnetic poles where XY forms a circuit with an ammeter. So basically there's an ammeter which is joined along with XY. Explain why the reading on the ammeter is zero when X, the wire X, Y is not moving. So I have written down the answer over here, but however, let's have a look at a detailed look at which rule we are using over here. So we're using the Fleming's left hand rule. Let's have a look at it very quickly. So as you see the picture over here, so this is your left hand. Use your left hand to make this. Thumb upward, right? All the three fingers are at 90 degrees with each other. The first finger points to the direction of the magnetic field. The second finger points to the direction of the current in the wire, right? So current in the wire, magnetic field, and thumb. That's how your left hand rule works. Now coming back to the question, remember how do the magnetic field lines work? They are from north to south. So this is the direction of the magnetic field lines, right? So your first finger, which was your magnetic field lines, that is what you will show left to right. And it says that, um, why is the reading on the ammeter zero when y, x, y is not moving? So the thumb, remember the thumb, which we show, which we saw over here, the thumb was the motion. So the there has to be a magnetic field, there has to be a current, then there will be motion. Or there is a magnetic field, there will be motion, then there will be current, right? It works both ways. So now, if the wire is not moving, that is, there is no motion, there will be no current, right? Or that's why your ammeter will be, reading will be zero. Now, let's move, uh, let's look at the B part. The wire X, Y is moved. Now, it's moving. And there is a deflection on the ammeter that indicates there is a current in wire from X to Y. So, this is the direction of current. So, remember the Fleming's left-hand rule. Let's go back to the rule again. So, first finger was magnetic field. Second finger was current's direction. Then third finger was thumb's direction, right? Look very carefully. Now let's apply that rule over here. So you have your first finger pointing left to right. Second finger going into the paper. That is X to Y. Then which way will your thumb point? It will point upwards, right? And that is what I it has been asked in the question over here. So click on one box to indicate the direction of movement. That is which way will the wire move. So it will move on the top of the page. This will be your answer. Explanation, current, magnetic field and motion of the wire are all at right angles. You have to write this down. You can also write the term Fleming's left hand rule and you can explain that if you want to. It's a three marker. So it's better that you explain the Fleming's left hand rule over here. 
Now, the C part. State what is observed on the ammeter when the wire XY is moved. So when so if the wire XY is moved to the opposite direction. So earlier it was moving like this. Now if you change the direction of the XY, wire XY, then obviously the deflection will be opposite. Again, you can verify this with Fleming's left-hand rule. Now, the second part is that if it's the same direction, but at a greater speed, that is the speed with which you're moving the x, y, y, that is more. So in that case, the deflection will be greater, right? Then comes the next question. Question number eight, define electromotive force. It is the energy required to drive one unit. So it's a basic definition which we are using over here. It's the energy needed to drive one unit of charge, one coulomb around the circuit. Now, B part. This question is kind of an important one and involves a lot of concepts. So we will go a little bit deeper into the concept over here. Look at this. Figure 8.1 shows source E of EMF 60 volts. So this is the potential difference in the circuit. Heater H has resistance of 22.5 ohms. And potential difference across it is also given. It is equal to 45 ohms. Volts. You have to calculate the power of the heat. So any formula of power which you remember would work here. So let's say power is equal to V times I, right? Let's use that. Power is VI. So you need the voltage across the heater, which is 45. I, we don't know. But we know from Ohm's law that IR is equal to V. So I will be V by R, right? So it will be 45 times 45 by 22.5. Let's see what that comes out to be. So it's 45 times 45 and divided by 22.5. So we get a 90 watt. Remember, the SI unit is very, very important over here. The working which you will show can be this much. It's fine if you give this much working. Okay. Next part, the potential difference across resistor x so across resistor x what is the potential difference now you have a 60 volt potential difference over here total remember when we are looking at a series circuit the potential difference changes in parallel circuit it remains same so over here the heater was using up there was a voltage drop of 45 volts that means you have 15 volts left over here this 15 volts will be the potential difference across this as well as this. So what is the potential difference across resistor X? It is 15 volts and that's your answer. I hope this was clear. Again, this is a parallel circuit. That's why it's a 15 volt in both across 10 ohms as well as across X ohms, right? Let's move on to the next one. The current in the 10 ohm resistor. So we have 10 ohm. We know the potential difference is 15 volts. We can use Ohm's law over here. Let's use that. So you have V is equal to IR. We have to find the current. So I will be V by R. V over here is 15. And R, R is 10. So I comes out to be 1.5 amperes. That is what you have to mention over here. You'll get your marks. Now let's move on to the ninth question. So what does it say? It tells us to write down the truth table for OR gate. So this is for OR gate what happens for all the inputs. If you have a single input as one, your output will result in one, right? So there are two inputs. This is input, let's say this is also input two, and this is the output. If both inputs are zero, output will be zero. If even one of the inputs is one, you will get the output as one. And of course, if you have both the inputs as one, the output will be one. So this is what you have to draw. You will get your two marks. Draw the symbol for NOR gate. NOR gate means not OR. So you draw an OR gate first. This is the OR gate. And you put a NOT. This is the symbol for NOR gate. Figure 9.1 shows a digital circuit designed to produce the values given in table 9.1 for the output S from two inputs P and Q. So there are two inputs over here and this is the output S. 
9.1 is the truth table for the circuit shown. Let's see what will actually happen in the circuit. Okay, let's first figure out what will happen. So if we have P as, let's talk about 0 and Q also as 0. So both are 0 and 0. This is a not gate. So from 0, it will become 1. So 0, 1 and S over here. When both P and Q are 0, you're getting S as 0. So this comes out to be 0. That is, let's quickly draw the truth table. So when you have, I'm talking about R and P because we already know what is P and Q, it's given. So we are talking about R and P. That is, if R is 1, P is 0, then our output is coming out to be 0, right? R is 1, P is 0, then output is coming out to be 0. Let's look at the next case. So what is happening in the next case? R P is 0, P is 0. So over here also it's coming 0. Q is 1. 1 means this becomes 0 because it's a not K. So P is 0, Q is 1 means R is 0. If both are 0, then S is coming out to be 0, right? Okay. Let's talk about the third point. That is, if you have, so I'll erase this. If you have P as 1, Q as 0. 0 means this becomes 1. So we have R as 1. And then if both are 1, S comes out to be 1, right? Okay. Let's talk about the last one. So we have P and Q both as 1. So if we have both as 1, this 1 comes becomes 0. So our R is 0 basically and this is 1. When 1 and 0 enter the gate, it gives us a 0. So 1, 1 and 0 will give us a 0. So which gate are we talking about? What is this gate X which we have over here? Look at the truth table very carefully. You have 1, 1. That is only when both the inputs are 1. Rest is zero. So we are talking about an AND gate over here. AND gate is the gate where only input, the output will be one only when both the inputs are one, right? So now we have figured out the table as well as the gate. So let me write it down, one, zero, one, zero. That's my table. And I already have the gate for AND. So state which type of gate. So complete the column. We have done it. You'll get one mark. Uh, which type of gate is used? It's an AND gate. And what is the explanation Explanation for the truth table of AND gate? Okay, moving on. State the proton number, nucleon number, and value of charge on an alpha particle. So when we talk about alpha particle, we are basically talking of a helium nucleus, right? How is it written? 4 and 2. What is 4 over here? It is the mass number or nucleon number, nu number of nucleons, protons plus neutrons. So that is 4. Proton number is number of protons, which is 2, and charge over here is plus 2 because it's a positively charged, right? B part. A nucleus of strontium-90 consists of 38 protons and 52 neutrons. So we have strontium-90 and its symbol is given as SR. It's 90 and it has 38 protons and 52 neutrons. So what do we have over here? We have 38 protons and 52 neutrons. Now this strontium is radioactive and it is having 38. So I'll write 38 over here, right? And it decays by beta emission. So when it emits a beta particle, what happens? The charge is negative one, mass is zero. And it gives out yttrium. Symbol of it is Y. It's a, so now you have to maintain the balance. That means the mass is zero. So mass of this will also be 90 because then only the left hand side will be balanced. And the charge to make the total charge is 38. You already have a minus one. So this will be 39 plus of course energy. So this will be the reaction when you have to complete and I have shown you how to complete the reaction. The idea is to balance out the mass numbers and the charge on both sides. Okay, let's move on to the next part. Half-life of radon 220 is 56 seconds. What do we mean by half-life? That whatever value it has right now, it will reduce to half of that value at 56 seconds, after 56 seconds. Okay, 
Now the sample of radon 220 is in a container after 1, 1, 2 seconds. 1, 1, 2 seconds means it is 56 times 2. That is two half-lives. The mass is 9.2 milligrams. That means this is the mass after two half-lives. So what was the mass? It will be times two after one half-life and another two after the second half-life, right? So in the beginning, the mass will be 9.2 times two times two or 9.2 times four. Let's see how much that comes out to be. 9.2 times four gives us 36.8 or roughly 37 milligrams. So that is what you will write over here. And let me erase this. This was just for explanation. So what you have to write in the working is, you can straight away write 9.6 times 4. That's also fine. And you will get your marks. Okay. That's all for this paper. I hope you understood this. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Thank you so much.